Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So today we are going to talk about two topics um, in this video. And we are going to go over um, cell cycle regulation. And we're also going to discuss asexual reproduction, some of the methods involved. So this is more of a summary um, of what, would this, what was discussed in class more than anything else. So let me get ready and let's start, let's start with the lesson. So when we talk about cell cycle regulation, we know that cells have to be have to regulate that everything in the cell division occurs accordingly, that there are no errors, no loose ends, or anything that can result in a genetic mutation and hence result in something much more, uh, much worse. Um, <clears throat> and some of the things that actually contribute um, to cell cycle regulation is what we call internal and external factors. So an external factor comes from outside of the cell and internal factors from inside the cell. And internal factors come from inside the cell, just like the word would suggest. Now to talk about some of them specifically, let's talk about a specific external factor. So let's go ahead and, and um, talk about that real quick. External factors, so let's talk about them. Now there are many external factors that are involved in cell cycle regulation or cell division. Um, but they mainly include physical and chemical signals, okay? So external factors include physical and chemical signals. And let's talk real quick about a physical signal of... Um, of, uh, of, of external factors. So a physical sim, um, a physical signal of, um, external factors or what we call cell to cell contact. And what cell to cell contact is, um, and let me illustrate it. So let's say we have a Petri dish and the cell is growing, or we have cells growing in that Petri dish. Now, cells were, will generally and normally continue to grow until exter some external factor stops the cell division. For example, it can be something as two cells physically coming in contact to one another. So let's say this cells, these cells continue to divide, then all of a sudden, these two cells right here come in contact with each other. And that is a physical external factor that will let the cell know that it is time to stop dividing. Now, we said that external factors include chemical signals as well. So let's talk about some of the chemical signals. So um, an example of a chemical signal is a growth factor. So ex a chemical, so we're still with external factors, but we're talking about a chemical signal. And more specifically, growth factor. So what is a growth factor? Now, we can define a growth factor as a group of proteins that stimulate cell division. A group of proteins that stimulate cell division. And two examples of those are the platelets
the platelets and the examples of growth factors are examples, excuse me, examples are platelets and the other one is called Erytho, erythropoietin. 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 So let's talk about them real quick. So platelets and erythropoietin. These are still chemical. Uh, these are still external factors, but they are chemical uh, external factors that are called growth factors. Now, they both have to do with the blood cells. In the case of the platelets, they basically um, help the cells clot. Uh, whenever you're, you're, you're bleeding, the platelets uh, are uh, the, this external chemical factor uh, trig triggers the platelets, which basically help or begin to clot the cell. Now, the other one, um, that is called the erythropoietin. Um, the erythropoietin is produces the or um, stimulates the production of red blood cells. Now let, let's let me explain this real quick. Um, so the like I said, the platelets basically whenever we get cut, they trigger um, cells that help blood clot. And the erythropoietin, if you go to, let's say, a, a place that has a high altitude, a very mountainous region, the uh, oxygen or the air pressure lowers. So this um, growth, this cell or this protein begins to produce red blood cells and is triggered by an external, external chemical growth factor. And it triggers the production of red blood cells, which helps our body or uh, which carries oxygen to other parts of our body. So those are two examples of growth factors, of external growth factors to be exact. Now let's talk real quick about the internal growth factors. Now, internal growth factors, and let me go ahead and delete this. Like we said at the beginning, internal growth factors come from inside the cell. So let's, let's, uh, or internal I'm sorry, in, internal factors, not internal growth factors. We said that internal factors come from the cell. So let's talk real quick about the internal factors. And we know that, um, that they come from inside the cell. So basically how internal factors work is that ex external factors rind, bind to their receptors and trigger internal factors. Okay, so... Let me go ahead and type that up real quick. So external factors, we're talking about internal factors, and we know that they come from inside the cell. And more importantly, or not more importantly, but a detail is that um, in internal growth factors, or it, it says, uh, or excuse me, when external uh, factors bind to their receptors, when external factors bind to their receptors and, and uh, they can trigger internal factors. Internal factors. Okay. And it says basically that uh, two of the most important and well-studied internal factors involve um, are kinesis and cyclin, all right? Kinesis and cyclin. So two internal factors, two well-studied internal factors include kinase, which is an enzyme, and 
cyclins. Okay, and cyclins. So basically kinase, what it does, it transfers a phosphate group to target a specific molecule, okay? Um, so the kinase, what it does is it, it, it um, releases a, pho a phosphate group that what it does is it triggers a, it triggers a specific or targets a specific molecule, excuse me. Okay, so again, a kinase is an enzyme um, that basically transfers a phosphate group from one molecule to a specific target molecule. So basically, kinase helps transfer phosphate groups. And we know that that's very important, especially if we go back to the production of ATP when we talked about in the, in the last chapter. So kinase is an internal factor, and it's very important for that. Um, it says that this action typically increases the energy of the target molecule or changes its shape. Again, we know from um, when we talked about the synthesis of ATP and we talked about photosynthesis and all these other uh, processes, how phosphate groups were transferred. And the other um, thing that we talk about, or the other internal factors, um, is the cyclins. And basically what the cyclins do um are are proteins that are rapidly made and destroyed at certain points in the cell cycle okay so again kinase transfers phosphate groups to a specific molecule and cyclins are cells that basically are born and or not cells excuse me are proteins that are basically made and destroyed so they're used for specific purposes and then they once they're not needed they're they're um they're basically uh deceased or stopped being produced by the body an example of of a cyclin or an example of this that has to do with the cyclin is what we call apoptosis and basically apoptosis is programmed cell death and this is a process that's not well known in detail uh, as, as, as to why it occurs. We know what it is. We just don't know why specifically it occurs. It can be triggered by many things. But one of the uh, examples of apoptosis is the webbed feet in uh, human development. So basically when... Um, baby is growing inside of a mother's womb, we have wet feet. And in, in the, the first and in, in certain stages of the pregnancy, then all of a sudden the apoptosis occurs. And those uh, fibers that make up kind of like make up kind of like that web feet or the web hands, right? I say web feet, but I meant web feet or web hands, um, which is kind of like a fiber growing in between the toes and the finger. So apoptosis occurs and those fibers that are growing between the, the fingers basically um, are destroyed. So I'm going to try to draw that. Let's say we have a regular hand. Let's see if I can draw a hand. So this is my drawing of a hand. I just realized I drew four fingers in my hand. Let's see if I can draw one more here. So basically, we have a hand. Now, um, up, uh, when the baby's being developed, they have webbing in the hands and toes. And it's kind of like this fiber that is right here between them, the fingers. And basically, what uh, an example of apoptosis is programmed cell death. Once these fibers are not needed, and as the as the baby begins to develop fully inside the mother's womb, apoptosis occurs and basically destroy these web uh, fingers or web feet. Okay, so that's an example of apoptosis, which we know is programmed cell death, and. Basically, 
this is um, also used in regulating the cell in certain cycles. So now that we, we, we know about that, let's go ahead and talk about um, cancer and cancer cells, because we do know that in a nutshell, we can define cancer as a um, uncontrolled division of cells. So let me go ahead and type up real quick the definition of cancer, and then we're going to go straight into binary fission. But basically, cancer um, is a disease that is characterized by uncontrolled cell divisions. Okay, cancer is a disease. It's a disease. A disease, and I just realized I didn't. I don't have a D. There you go. Characterized by uncontrolled cell growth. Characterized by uncontrolled cell growth. Uncontrolled cell growth. There you go. Sorry for that. So, um, and it arises when cell regulation breaks down. So basically when cell regulation is not functioning correctly is when certain types of cancer can arrive, arise. When cell It arises when uh, cell cycle regulation breaks down. Breaks down. Okay. So let me go ahead real quick and just kind of continue here. And, you know, when a cancer is developed, we have what is called a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. So a benign, in a benign tumor, a benign tumor cells remain clustered together um, remain clustered together so they remain clustered together and they don't spread and usually when a tumor is considered to be benign um, it's usually extracted and no complications arise uh, in contrast, a malignant tumor, has metastasized. And basically when we, what we mean by metastasize, um, is that it spreads. So malignant tumors are those tumors where the cell clusters grow, but they spread. Um, that's what metastasize mean. In the case of um, in the case of in the case of malignant tumors, um, they spread through the bloodstream or the lymphatic system, which is basically the system in our bodies that kind of absorbs all the waste products and all those things that we have. So um, cancer can be caused by an array of things. Um, cancer can be caused by, well, one of the things that, um, 
can cause cancer can be exposure to radiation so damaged gene they damaged genes i'm sorry damaged genes can cause cancer when they can't produce a specific protein exposure to radiation um such as x-rays and x-ray technicians early early on in the 20th century in the late 19th centuries when x-rays were being studied a lot of people died from overexposure to of the x-rays because they cause mutations which is basically they um they mess up the gene right um they and and that causes a mutation um not just x-rays but uv rays from sunlight um also exposure to certain substances called carcinogens and just so you guys have an idea carcinogens um are substances um that are known to promote cancer so exposure to carcinogen carcinogens carcinogens which um are substances that promote cancer Okay, um, example, plastic, which is why there are certain plastics that's not microwavable um, and you can't heat food there because that could cause the plastic to melt and, or transfer into the food and which can promote carcinogens. There are substances such as tobacco and smoke that can produce carcinogens. Um, there's even a, a, a bunch of theories regarding you know, certain food or chemical products that can promote um, cancer or there are considered carcinogen. So, and one more thing is viruses. There are actually certain viruses that can cause cancer. For example, the uh, their cervical cancer is uh, caused by a specific virus that can... Um, that that when once it attacks the system, it actually has the uh, effect of or side effect of actually promoting uh, cancer. So, guys, as I was saying, these are some of the important concepts of uh, cell cycle regulation, and of course, the importance of this is that uh, if the these processes function properly, they can help avoid. Uh, certain types of cancer or other complications that may arise from cell cycle regulation. So now we're actually going to go into our next topic, which is asexual reproduction. So I'm actually going to go ahead and clear the drawings and asexual reproduction. So let's first of all, compare and contrast between the two of them. And we're going to talk a little bit about binary fission. So asexual reproduction Or, or let's talk about sexual reproduction, which involves the joining of two species. Involves the joining of two species, or not two species, sorry, the joining of two specialized cells, excuse me. Sexual reproduction involves the joining of excuse me of two specialized cells called gametes which are also known as sperm and And X. So that's basically, and the makeup, of course, and um, the result, or this results in an offspring.
that have a mixture of genes from both parents. So sexual reproduction is basically the joining, uh, we talk about in human terms, of the sperm and the egg cell, and the result is a unique offspring that is a combination, a genetic combination of uh, the traits of one uh, parent and the traits of another. And I was explaining, explaining in class that even though twins are, gen are identical um, and have pretty much the same DNA, they're still unique because even though they're identical twins, they are still a combination of one parent and the genetic combination of another. Now, asexual reproduction is the creation of offspring from a single parent. A sexual reproduction is the creation of offspring from a single parent without the joining of gametes. So a sexual reproduction, pretty much one organism literally divides itself into another one, a genetically identical copy of itself. So binary fission and mitosis. So first of all, let's talk about binary fission and define what binary fission is. And binary fission is the sexual, or excuse me, is the asexual reproduction of a single celled organism, binary fission is the asexual reproduction of a single celled organism single-celled organism by division in the two roughly equal parts. By division into two roughly equal parts. Okay? And Binary fission and mitosis have similar results. We know that um, mitosis, basically you have two daughter cells uh, result from the division of the nuclear content. So binary fission, binary fission and mitosis have similar results. And what that is, is that both processes form have similar results because both processes form two daughter cells that are genetically identical. Two uh, cells that are genetic, two daughter cells that are gen genetically identical to the parent cell, of course. Got that detail. That are genetically identical to the parent cell. So basically, what happens, and um, I'm going to try to illustrate it as best as I can. And this is used in single cell organisms, uh, mainly prokaryotes, although there are certain eukaryotes that do undergo this process, and, and we'll talk about that 
in a minute. Um, but just so you have an idea, let me illustrate what this is. So basically in binary fission, you have a parent cell. And the DNA inside of that parent cell begins to duplicate. And usually you have a parent cell. And let's see if I can use a different color. And you have the DNA here. Remember that prokaryotes don't have nuclear bound organelles. So basically it's kind of like a circle. And they're usually in a circle. Not always, but usually. Then the DNA begins to duplicate. Which means that pretty much... The DNA begins to separate into, let me use a different color, into two different ex, uh, extreme uh, sides of the cell. You have part of it here, and then the other part here. And then the cell kind of begins to stretch a little bit. In the third step, the cell, you know what, the cell begins to divide and here the cell actually begins to divide so you kind of have something like this starting to form out like when you pull a marshmallow apart when you try to pull a marshmallow apart right so the cell and this is a very bad 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 illustration of that but just so you guys have an idea the the cell begins to duplicate or to divide and the DNA is here and the DNA is here. And then finally, at the end, you have two daughter cells that are genetically identical to the parent cell. So this is binary fission. And a lot of prokaryotes, bacteria, actually undergo binary fission to divide. And there you have the DNA here, sponges, um, sea sponges there actually uh, reproduce asexually as well. So that's an example more or less of a binary fission, how it works. Um, it says in bacteria, binary fission starts when the bacterial chromosome is copied. Both chromosomes are attached to the cell membrane. As the cell grows and gets longer, the chromosomes move away from each other. So in bacteria, let's see if I can... If I can illustrate that to you guys, and hopefully that will be the end of this video. And both of these concepts are, you guys are good with them. So let's see how this works in bacteria. So in bacteria, you have a cell So in bacteria, or most prokaryotes, you have a cell. And let's see, I'm going to try to do it to the best of my abilities. We'll use Kareem, which is what they use in your book to illustrate it, right? And basically, these are the, 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 the DNA is here. And because they don't have membrane-bound organelles... You know, they're kind of like circular. So the first step, it says that the bacteria, um, it starts when the bacterial chromosome is copied. So what starts to happen in the second step here, and this is very simple. Obviously, because single cell organisms, their cells are, compared to eukaryotes are relatively simple, the process is much simpler than cell cycle, but that doesn't mean that it's it's not you know it's not right or there's no detail. It just means that when you compare it to um, to um, the way eukaryotic cells reproduce, which undergoes a series of regulations, especially in our bodies, um, you know, genetically speaking uh, or molecularly speaking, if I can use that term, human beings are are very advanced in compared to some organisms, although there are organisms that have a better immune system and so on and so forth. But the point that I'm trying to get at is that the 
the um, binary fission compared to the cell cycle that we undergo is uh, simpler. Not easy, not because if we study the process in detail, we'll see that there are a lot of chemical reactions that occur. But compared to to us, to our cell division process, it's a little bit more complex. So we see here that the DNA is starting to divide. You see that they're starting to form a little bit of a ridge uh, here, you know, and, and we have here kind of like the cells DNA begins to divide. So there's a little bit of a ridge starting to form here. Okay, and that's where all those red lines are. So that's when the DNA inside of the bacteria begins to kind of um, separate. And then in the third step of um, binary fission in bacteria, you have the cell divided in two. So you have, and again, it says uh, the, which is the second step, it says that both chromosomes, uh, it says that, um, I'm sorry, the bacterial DNA chromosome is copied. Then after that, both chromosomes are attached to the cell as the cell growth and gets longer. So in the third, so here, the and step one, the chromosomes are beginning to be copied. In step two, <clears throat> which is the second step that we see there, they're beginning to get attached to the cell. And then in step three, we see how the cell grows longer. So in step three, what we're going to have is a chromosome with a DNA that is completely copied. And you have binary fission in bacteria. Here we go. So let's see if I can wait a minute. Give me one sec to see if I can draw almost like it's in the book. Obviously the, the illustration in the book looks a lot better, but so you guys have an idea of what I'm talking about. And of course, there are its advantages and disadvantages to binary fission. Advantages is that, well, or to asexual reproduction, excuse me, is that asexual reproduction um, does not require or doesn't need to mate. Uh, the organism doesn't need to mate. It can just make a carbon copy literally of itself. Uh, disadvantage is that um, organisms that undergo sexual reproduction are much more are adaptable. Um, and the species, uh, because as um, sexual reproduction or the joining of gametes occurs, um, according to Darwin's theory and other scientists, um, offsprings begin to evolve. Of course, that evolution can take hundreds, thousands, millions, and even billions of years. But it's an advantage of sexual reproduction. So guys, uh, this is a sexual reproduction, the process of binary fission, cell cycle reproduction. Hopefully this video is useful to you guys. So stay safe and we'll see each other in our next class. So you do me a favor. You have yourselves a good day. Bye.